आगे से जो भी कम तो लाइट्स आर विजिबल नाउ सो सो अगेन वंस अगेन वेलकम टू वन फिफ्टी फिफ्थ एडिशन विद अ ब्रेकिंग न्यूज दैट एन एम सी गाइडलाइंस आर इन अबियंस सो यू कैन विदाउट एनी इश्यूज वॉच दिस प्रोग्राम नाउ ट्रीटमेंट इम्प्लीकेशन ऑफ लॉन्गिट्यूडल कोर्स ऑफ बाइपोलर डिसऑर्डर आई थिंक वील वील गेट टू नो सम वेरी गुड थिंग्स अबाउट अ वेरी ऑफन रिपीटेड टॉपिक बिकॉज यू हैव वेरी एरोडाइट स्पीकर विद टूडे uh tofan sir if you are here i am handing over the session to you uh, tofan sir is the chairman of this program he is from katak and professor of psychiatry uh, sir would you like to take over thank you thank you ali ma'am taking over and uh, uh, now i have the first duty to introduce our vibrant moderators dr abhik patrasi who is this a professor of psychiatry high tech medical college and dr alim siddiqui who is the chair of ipx both are well known in ips as well as in this platform i have the pleasure to introduce dr naresh tejilani a dear friend of mine as the chairperson of this session the professor and head of psychiatry ms jodhpur organizing activities explains uh, subdin student sulfar ms jodhpur co chairperson in ips research and training foundation honorary general secretary in nem psychiatric society narsu editor general of indian association of child and adult psychiatry From 2018 to 2021, Associate Director for Norms of Psychiatric Research. His area of interest are child and adolescent mental health, conceptual liaison psychiatry, and addiction medicine. He has got 14 years of research experience, around 210 articles, peer re in peer reviewed journals, 20 chapters, and two, four book editions, awards and fellowships, 22, including Dr. Sardar Menon DMP Gold Medal, Dr. A K Kala Award, Dr. Bhakti Award, Dr. Chishi Bora Award. at sulanki award wp association asian early career package fellowship welcome dr naresh thank dr. you sir please. good evening sir good evening dr manoj sig author a fellow of ips iipp and international fellow of apa very close and very dear to me senior psychiatrist and director at gautam hospital as professor of psychiatry jain medical college jaipur organized four national conference one national become senior two state conferences publications 15 national publications one chapter in two hours three national and one state hour research 16 icsgcp in the previous studies served as secretary and chairperson of various committees of ips iipp iacm airdsi mhs he was invited speaker in national conferences and cmi news channels welcome dr manosi welcome dr bhagwani thanks for your the meeting is yours please take over and i am in a place where i can lose an edge If I lose, please excuse me. Whenever possible, I shall join. Doctor Naresh and Doctor Manasi, please take over. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, yeah. one of them can. Introduce. Yeah, one of you can introduce the speaker. The other can introduce the topic. Yeah, Manasi, sir, please. I think some network issue at his end. Uh, Manasi yeah. has some network issues, so Naresh, by so, you. Sorry, so, sorry for that. uh grower sir is my teacher guru so he needs no introduction and uh, he is uh, teacher of teachers his uh, citations are about 15000 he is editor of many national journals and associate of many national journals and again now going towards the uh, the cv part in which the numerous awards about 62 and thrice by icmr his core area of interest are cl psychiatry geriatric psychiatry severe mental disorder and psychopharmacology and he is uh, uh, maybe many of you might be knowing him through the research but uh, hardcore clinician and we have learned most of clinical tips from him and again a very great teacher so it's beyond the research part and again he is going to teach us on very important topic uh, dr manasvi sir would you like to in, uh, introduce about the topic please unmute yourself 
I I got a lim- limited connectivity issue yes, here. Sir, I, I understand. Sir. It's getting interrupted in between. Sure. But sure, sure, I think sure. this today's topic is going to be a very vital topic because it talks about something which is known about psychiatric illnesses, the chronicity. And with chronicity also comes a long t- treatment adherence, uh, relapses, then recurrences and all those things. So the key again and again somewhere comes on the outcome wise on the adherence of the treatment and the long stay of treatment person being invested into the treatment for a long time and how does it, it throw challenges and all we are going to listen to the learned speaker of the day today uh, thank you so, manasvi uh, and naresh and also thank you uh, the organizers uh, tufan pati sir he is my teacher i did my mbbs from the institute where he served as a professor of psychiatry and my dear friend alim and amrit for inviting me uh, today i am going to talk about understanding the course and outcome of bipolar disorder i will try to keep the topic more simple for all of us to understand the what message i want to convey through this talk and before i start my talk i would like to disclose that i as such i don't have any conflict of interest when i'm presenting this talk but i'll just like to disclose that i'm the co-author of clinical practice guidelines for bipolar disorders published by the indian psychiatric society so let's move to the topic as we all understand that bipolar disorder is an episodic illness with primary and the primary aim of treatment which we need to understand is achieving euthymia but when we talk about uh the bipolar disorder per se we understand that there are two different kinds of episode that is the uh, manic or hypomanic episode or the depressive episode so the the basic aim when we are trying to look at these episode is we are primarily trying to achieve the euthymia but and when we look at the available treatment guidelines in over last 13 14 years we have seen the proliferation of about five six major guidelines for management of bipolar disorders so so these all guidelines tell us lot about how to manage the acute episodes how to do the uh, take care of the uh, continuation phase and the maintenance phase so what basically all these guidelines highlight they say that when you are trying to manage any of these phase you need to use a combination of pharmacological and the non pharmacological treatment and do psychoeducation of the patient and the family and if required use somatic treatment and the basic aim of different phases vary but in acute phase the primary aim is to achieve uh, response and remission and, and then ensure the medication adherence and minimize the side effect and in the continuation phase we need to maintain the response prevent further relapses and recurrence improve the medication adherence and monitor and minimize the side effect and the maintenance phase basically focuses on the final health outcome that is the reduction in the number of episodes and reduction in self harm improving functioning reducing the severity of illness and promoting recovery so so is there anything more to learn or understand beyond this when we are trying to manage a patient of bipolar disorder should i be stopping my talk here itself we do we have enough information in this my talk till now or do we need to look further so so let's try to understand that what is the clinical reality which guidelines don't tell us that the bipolar disorder is a heterogeneous disorder there are multiple treatment outcomes rational polypharmacy is usually recommended when we compare to other psychiatric disorders it is the poly, possibly the only disorder where rational polypharmacy is recommended and non adherence to treatment and breakthrough while patient is taking the proper treatment is again very common in patient of bipolar disorder and when we look at the course and outcome of bipolar disorder it is discussed more from a perspective of treatment response rather than good or bad prognostic factor so so that is where uh, we, we understand the course and outcome of bipolar disorder but can we manage all patient of bipolar disorder by following the recommended guidelines which have been given by the different associations do they give us enough understanding or do they guide us enough in taking the different factors as with course and bipolar course and outcome of bipolar disorder is something very important to understand so when we are looking at this acute phase continuation phase and maintenance phase let's first look at how do we all clinically practice uh, I, i think many of you will agree when i say this that the usual tendency is to start treatment by considering the most recent episodes so if you are seeing a patient with bipolar uh, depression you think choose a drug which is effective in taking care of the acute phase of bipolar depression and similarly when you are managing a patient with bipolar mania you think about using agents which can take care of the manic phase 
And once the patient improves, if you are using benzodiazepines or if you are using antidepressant, you may just think of withdrawing some of the medications or at times people, if they are using antidepressant, they keep on using it for much longer period. Or if they are using a combination of mood state or an antipsychotic, this is continuation for a long period. Yes, often most of us try to withdraw the benzodiazepine. That's how the usually we practice. But is this practice good or correct? So what we need to understand that this approach actually often destabilizes the bipolar illness and this can be detrimental to the long run of the case and that's why it is always important to take both into account that is the acute phase and also the longitudinal approach in looking at the whole course of bipolar disorder which patient has suffered should be taken into account while deciding about the management of acute episode continuation phase and the maintenance phase so when we look at understanding the course and outcome of bipolar disorder, we need to understand that there are different risk factors besides the genetic risk factor, family history. We now understand uh, early childhood adversities, adversities like childhood sexual abuse or comorbidities, physical or psych uh, psychiatric comorbidities or substance use are commonly considered as a risk factor for development of bipolar disorders. And the, as the course of bipolar disorder continues and the amount of life even the patient experiences will determine the subsequent uh, episodes and at times treatment in terms of that how you use antidepressant or don't use antidepressant will determine further episodes of bipolar disorder and as the course progresses the prevalence of psychiatric and medical comorbidities keeps on increasing and as the course age goes beyond certain age for the onset there are different other factors which play a role in the onset of bipolar disorder. So what we need to change in our routine clinical practice when we approach a patient of bipolar disorder. So what we need to do, why we need to do and how we need to do is something which we need to think about. So what all factors must be taken into account while choosing pharmacotherapy for bipolar disorder and that will be influenced by what all factors actually influence the course and outcome of bipolar disorder is something which we need to ponder about and understand. So as we are choosing the mood stabilizer for a patient, we need to also look at what are the destabilizers in a particular patient when and what these, these destabilizers are contributing to the course of illness. Having a proper understanding of that can often help. So what are the important factors was one somebody needs to keep in mind when you're looking at the course and outcome of a bipolar disorder. So, so I've listed this in about 16 headings, uh, sorry, 12 headings, which I'm going to discuss with you. And there could be many more factors which anybody else can point out, but this is how broadly I would like to divide my talk. So when we look at the age of onset of bipolar disorder, why it becomes important, why we need to look at. So early age of onset, that is, it is defined for bipolar disorder as age less than 18 or less than 21 is considered to be early onset bipolar disorder and it is associated with poor response to treatment. That is something which we all of us need to understand. So when we, I say poor response to treatment means it will be associated with more frequent and more number of episodes. And what is associated with early onset is again, it brings in a lot of comorbidity along with it, which could include substance use, psychiatric comorbidities, uh, other uh, conduct disorders, eating disorders and so on. And this is more often associated with family history of bipolar disorder that means early onset bipolar or people those who have early onset bipolar have more of biological factors uh, associated with this so that will influence the course and we need to look for comorbidities in patient who have early onset bipolar and we need to manage the comorbidities also while managing the patient of bipolar disorder further in terms of when we look at the uh, episodicity and other things we, we need to understand the early onset is again associated with higher number of episodes per year and more often is associated with RCAD and more often associated with mixed kind of features, psychotic symptoms during the, uh, the episodes. And there are more manic episodes in the lifetime and usually patients with early onset uh, bipolar disorder respond poorly to lithium, although the evidence is mixed in that, but that's something, some evidence supports this. So this is the, what we need to understand. Just having an understanding of early onset can, or the onset age of onset can help you in deciding what medications you want to use. And similarly, this definition of late onset bipolar disorder, which is defined as age of onset after 50 years. And mostly when you're looking at a patient with late onset bipolar disorder, always remember comorbidity and also various differential diagnosis because delirium, dementia can present with many kind of features themselves 
or patient with on various medical uh, medications or substance use or cerebral vascular injuries or other organic factors can lead to manifestation of manic symptoms. So, so that is where when you need to look at when you're looking at a person with late onset bipolar disorder, you need to keep this in mind that whether we are dealing with a new onset bipolar disorder or is it a mood disorder related to the general medical condition or is it some kind of a resolution of mania without recurrence? So what are you looking at? You need to keep that in mind. Keep that in mind when you're deciding about the medication and deciding about further how to investigate and how to manage the patient. Then there's an issue of polarity of first episode of, uh, uh, in the lifetime. Again, many people will not focus on that. And as we now understand that uh, the bipolar is understood as two different kinds. One is the DMI pattern or the MDI pattern. So if somebody has a first episode in lifetime as depression or mania, that helps in de determining this kind of a polarity. And what is shown that a person who has a first episode of mania in the lifetime is more likely to respond to lithium than those who have a DMI pattern. But again, understand, although lithium works well for depression, but in M when it comes to looking at the pattern of MDI or DMI, MDI pattern is something which uh, does better with lithium. Then comes the issue of number of episodes and types of episodes. This is something uh, everybody of us needs to focus on when you're looking at bipolar disorder, because this is something which will determine a lot of various aspects about the management. We, we all understand this DSM-5 terminology now of bipolar type 1 and type 2. If a patient has a full-blown manic episode, we talk it as consider that as bipolar 1. And if somebody keeps on having hypomanic episodes only along with the depressive episode, of course, we know as bipolar 2. And we also need to understand that beyond bipolar 1 and 2, authors, especially Ekeskal, describe other subtypes of bipolar as bipolar 1, 1 and half, and so on, 4. And later on, go, went on to add the bipolar 5 and 6. So these all subtypes basically takes into account not only the type of episodes and the duration or the chronicity of the episode, but also they take into account the temperament, use of antidepressant, substance, and the so-called organicity. So, so when, when we look at this, having a proper understanding of these factors in the course of bipolar is often becomes important because this all also can influence the, the episodicity and also the kind of medications which you are going to choose or what kind of medication we are going to avoid. And in terms of further understanding the types of episodes and the number of episodes, we all need to have a proper understanding about the seasonal affective disorder and the rapid cycling. Rapid cycling, which is understood as four or more episodes in a year. Uh, in terms of seasonal affective disorder, DSM-5, categorizes something as seasonal affective disorder when the depressive episode begin and end during the specific season of the year. It is seen for at least two years. And these people are required to have more seasons of depression than seasons without depression. And this basically in the Western culture, they talk about the winter blues. So this is why, why, why it is important because we are trying to treat, treat a patient with seasonal affective disorder, just using conventional method, and you're missing out on the seasonality, then you may not be using the appropriate treatment because the seasonal affective disorders often respond to uh, use of, uh, require use of antidepressant or maybe light therapy, or some, there's some evidence to suggest use of vitamin D or depending on the severity, you can use the psychosocial interventions. And in terms of rapid cycling, we all need to understand that rapid cycling, again, is associated with, as I said earlier, also early age of onset and more severe course of bipolar disorder. And it's also associated with uh, hypothyroidism and use of antidepressant. And it also leads to poor outcome in the form of higher number of suicide attempts. Now, when you're looking at the rapid cycling disorders, we need to understand which drugs work better for the rapid cycling. So the, what is the evidence uh, does it suggest? that eripiprazole, olanzapine, and valproate are much better for managing an acute manic or a mixed episode in patients with RCID, whereas quetiapine is better for the acute depressive episode, and eripiprazole and lamotrigine are better for the relapse prevention. That's some kind of evidence some people suggest. But when we look at further kind of evidence, what is available, it is very clear that in patients with bipolar 2 especially, Lamotrigine is much better than placebo for management of uh, prevention of recurrence in patients with rapid cycling. And in terms of lithium and valproate, uh, the, it is said no conclusive evidence, but what is said that 
use of a combination of mode stabilizer that is the use of two mode stabilizer is better than using a single mode stabilizer so that's where it it becomes important that if you look at the longitudinal course and you understand that this patient is actually running an rcad course maybe you can think of using two mode stabilizers together and prevent the further recurrence of the episode then coming to the next concept of predominant polarity again this is something which uh, is not given too much of importance, but this again can have a lot of implication in understanding or choosing the medication. So what we understand by the predominant polarity is the what is the predominant polarity and then that's how we define it is in two ways. One is a Barcelona definition, which according to which if patient has two thirds of a particular kind of episode, he is assigned to that uh, polarity. For example, if you look at here, this is a manic predominant polarity. So if you look at that patient has about seven episodes, five of them are manic, so it is predominantly manic polarity. Two third are more than two third is manic, uh, and similarly here you have more of depressive episodes. So you you understand this as uh, the depressive predominant polarity, and then is the next is the undetermined predominant polarity. Just give me one sec, madam. I talk later on. I call back. Karun. So so that's how the Barcelona definition goes, and there's the other definition is the Harvard gen, uh, definition, which talks about 50% of either polarity. So again, that the polarity can be manic, depressive, or the undetermined polarity. So why looking at this polarity becomes important? Because we now understand the different uh, medications which are used for management of uh, bipolar disorder have different kind of potency to manage particular phase that is the, they have more of either an antidepressant, uh, higher antidepressant properties or higher anti-manic uh, properties. So if somebody has more of manic episodes, it would be better to choose drugs like Respiridone, Paliperidone, Eripiprazole, but somebody who has more predominantly depressive episodes in then Lamotrigine and Luracidone may be a better drug. That's how we, if, if you understand the longitudinal course of bipolar, it may help you to choose the drugs bo at both in the acute phase and also in the maintenance phase. And when we look at the predominant polarity, what is the clinical evidence and the, in terms of various uh, commonly used mood stabilizers, lithium, valproate, and lamotrigine, the evidence suggests that the predominant uh, depressive polarity responds to lamotrigine. So that is, again, we need to understand that if, if you have figured out the course, this can again be very, very useful. Next, coming to the other important aspect, which is recurrent mania. Now, recurrent mania is something which is very particular to India. And if you look at the most of the literature coming on uh, uh, recurrent mania, in fact, most of that has come from India and people have tried to define it. So this is basically a bipolar disorder where there is no depressive episode. Again, as I pointed out earlier, so here the choice of the drugs will again vary. If you try to keep on using drugs like more of quetepine, acinepine, these may not be that useful in patients of recurrent mania, better be to go towards something like respiridone. So that is where a difference has to be kept in mind when you're thinking about the longitudinal course of the bipolar disorder. Next, coming to the issue of antidepressant induced switch again, we, we need to understand when to say that there is an antidepressant switch. This is something which, again, people don't understand when to say whether it's an antidepressant induced switch. So let's first try to understand who, which are the people who are likely to have antidepressant switch. So again, the literature has been divided into two different parts among those who are on mood stabilizer and those who are not on mood stabilizers. Those who are not on mood stabilizer, mostly it is seen with tricyclic antidepressants. Those who are on mood stabilizers, the antidepressant switch is more commonly seen in people, those who have higher rates of previous switches, lower rate of response to antidepressant, that could be basically a criteria that you're using higher doses of antidepressant, ultimately you're going to have a switch and the earlier age of onset. So these are the people you need to keep in mind who are going to have an antidepressant switch. And, and if, if, if you look at the various guidelines, how do they, they suggest that again, TCA has the higher risk followed by uh, along with amphetamine and use of drugs like modafinil, primipexol, these are considered to have also higher potency to cause antidepressant switch. And if you look at that, SSRIs, in fact, may have much lower risk of switch. So that is where we need to understand that at times many people are also scared of using antidepressant in patients with bipolar. So that fact needs to be kept in mind that depending on if you know the course and predominant polarity, it will give you more, much more confidence in choosing the antidepressant or using the antidepressant in these patients. Then coming to the number of episodes in the lifetime, Again, one important fact here need to understand is that 
what is the relationship between the more number of episodes and response to lithium so in that higher number of lifetime episode that is more than 10 is considered to be a poor predictor of response to lithium this is where we be, we need to keep in mind that just counting the number of episodes can also help you in deciding about the medication uh, and what what we do look at the uh, people with higher number of episodes in fact they may actually respond better to valproate and valproate is also preferred drug for people with comorbid substance abuse and mixed episodes and whereas females are poor uh, are poor responders to valproate and there are a lot of other indications in which actually you are not supposed to use valproate in reproductive age group in among the females now coming to the understanding the symptoms of the current episode again sometimes we get carried away by the just looking at some of the symptoms but we need to understand that presence of atypical symptoms that especially atypical depressive symptoms their mao may be more useful presence of psychotic symptom will require use of antipsychotics and the catatonia will require its own management now earlier we talked about mixed episode but now the concept of in dsm5 the concept of mixed has changed and we are now talking about mixed features which can be attributed to both depression and mania until now we do not have clear cut guidelines so whatever the guidelines are there they are more for mania with mixed features so especially it becomes important when you are talking about assessing uh, mixed features among patients of depression that can help in guiding whether you should be using an antidepressant under the cover of a mood stabilizer or not. That, that will be the factor which you need to take in, into account. Coming to the suicidality again, patient who is very suicidal, please understand this fact that lithium has high anti-suicidal properties and it may be a good choice in patients who are suicidal or are making frequent suicide attempts. Uh, there you may prefer to use lithium. Coming to certain personal characteristics, again, we, we all understand that demographic factors can also have an important role in deciding about the medication. As I've already said, that females are not suited. Uh, in fe females of reproductive age, you should not be using valproid because of the risk of uh, pregnancy and PCOD. And also, they are actually, they show poor response to valproid. So in that case, a generic case, reproductive age group females try to choose drugs other than valproate that's if you remember that basic dictum you'll be safe from different perspective then are the other issues in terms of reaction to stress how a person copes with stress how he takes about the illness as stigma the other personality traits and temperament which i've already highlighted in some of the earlier slides needs to be considered while you're deciding about the bipolar disorder course and again we need to understand the issue of the uh, the kindling and also the how as uh, the course of bipolar disorder continues, the, the amount of stress required for a relapse is much smaller. So we, we need to keep that in mind when you're evaluating the case of a patient with bipolar disorder and how you make them aware about managing their stress in their life. Coming to the issue of comorbidity, again, this is something often not taken into account while choosing the drugs or uh, not taken into account in, uh, in terms of not diagnosed. So, so we, we need to understand that uh, comorbidity, which is under stress presence of more than one disorder in a person. And in bipolar disorder, it is a, a rule rather than an exception. And the commonly talked about comorbidities in patients with bipolar disorder, especially the psychiatric comorbidities, includes the anxiety disorders, substance use disorders, and the behavioral disorders. So when we look at the anxiety disorders, how common are they? So the, in this review, if you look at that, this, this is a review of all meta-analysis and reviews which were available and it shows that overall prevalence of anxiety disorder in patients with bipolar disorder is about 40 to 47 41 to 47 percent with about so one fifth of the patient having panic disorder and one sixth uh, to uh, having generalized anxiety disorders and other uh, anxiety disorders it becomes important because many times undiagnosed anxiety is considered to be a relapse of depression and that's why we, we don't manage anxiety properly and that's why it keeps on destabilizing the bipolar disorder. So if, if you look at the comorbidity, another important issue to understand that in terms of association of various comorbidities, most of these comorbidities actually precede the onset of bipolar disorder. So many of them actually precede the onset of bipolar disorder means uh, that is why we need to understand whether these comorbidities do they predict or are they acting as a risk factor for development of bipolar disorder. So a lot of the data is there in terms of the uh, systematic reviews and other things. What does this data suggest? Basically, that use of alcohol, cannabis, 
nicotine and non-medical use of prescription medications. So all these increase the risk of development of bipolar disorder later on. So, so, so we, we need to keep this in mind. And when you're doing a psychoeducation of your patient, uh, th this factor needs to be uh, discussed with them very clearly. And the other fact which has been uh, looked at why this occurs because of a lot of genetic and the uh, familiarity overlap between these disorders. Uh, the Again, there is overlap of uh, temperament which fuels both kind of disorders and uh, it also the comorbidity leads to early onset of bipolar disorder, increases the recurrence rate and there are more many uh, mixed kind of episodes and rapid cycling. So that's the we, we need to keep in mind and the comorbid anxiety disorders uh, are especially the PTSD can again influence the course of bipolar disorder. The uh, next question is whether the substance use destabilizes the course of bipolar disorder. So again, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that alcohol especially is known to destabilize the bipolar disorder and increases the risk of development of the rapid cycling. And if, if you look at the pharmacotherapies for use uh, management of patients with comorbid bipolar disorder and the substance use, what is the evidence? So as I've talked about earlier also, valproate is a preferred drug. And if patient has predominant depressive kind of polarity, maybe you think of using lamotrigine there. So that is where you, you need to, if the patient has predominant uh, many polarity and substance use, valproate may be a preferred drug, but predominant depressive polarity and uh, substance use, lamotrigine may be a preferred drug. In, in terms of physical comorbidities, again, we need to understand the prevalence of comorbidities. Uh, physical comorbidities are much higher in patients with bipolar disorder when compared to the general population. And the prevalence rates are as high as more than 90%. That more than 90% people will have at least one uh, physical comorbidities. And higher uh, prevalence of 2 to 5 comorbidities is seen. And the mean number of comorbidities in patients with bipolar disorder is about 3. And as the age keeps on increasing, the, pre pre the prevalence of physical comorbidities and multiple physical comorbidities keeps on increasing. And when so what we when we talk about what are the different types of comorbidities, almost all kind of comorbidities have been reported. And if you look at the commonly reported comorbidities, the mainly it, these are something like endocrine disorder, like hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, and diabetes mellitus, respiratory in terms of COPD, asthma, and OSA, and a lot of uh, HIV and SCV infections are again reported. But in terms of neurological disorders, migraine, multiple sclerosis, epilepsy has also been frequently reported. And the, the cardiac diseases like hypertension and coronary artery disease have been reported in patients with bipolar disorder. But this is in, in terms of small sample size studies. A recently uh, done major sample size study, which included 20,000 bipolar patients and about 14,000 of their siblings and about 15 lakhs of the control group. This is a Danish-based, uh, population-based study. And what they, they showed is important, that presence of physical comorbidity decreases the life expectancy of patients with bipolar disorder by 7.7 .7 years. And the risk of mortality is about two times. And when the physical comorbidity is pre present, the risk of mortality due to suicide increases by 18 times and that due to physical disorders increases by two times. So that's the implication of understanding why it is important to look for physical comorbidities, how you can uh, improve the course and outcome of bipolar disorder. And in terms of uh, the various physical comorbidities, how do they influence the course and outcome of bipolar disorder? What kind of data we have? So it has been shown that uh, presence of hypothyroidism definitely increases the risk of uh, having more of manic relapses in patients with bipolar disorder. For others, the evidence is not very clear, but uh, hypothyroidism per se definitely increases the risk of uh, development of uh, uh, more of manic episodes. The, the other reviews which have been done for specific physical comorbidities, one few are which are important to mention here is migraine, again, which is a common comorbidity but not looked at. Uh, again, this systematic review, which included 38 studies, talk, talked about prevalence of migraine varying from 2 to 70 percent. And again, migraine is known to have significant negative impact in terms of the number of episodes and the course of bipolar disorder. That, that's something which we need to keep in mind. And in terms of females, again, the hormonal changes have significant impact on the course and outcome of bipolar disorder. And in this, the most important thing is recognizing the PMDD. It has been seen that presence of PMDD per se actually increases the risk of other psychiatric comorbidity. 
so so those people who do those who have pmdd will have more more comorbid for comorbid other psychiatric disorders so that's the important fact to be remembered when you're evaluating a patient of bipolar disorder so pmdd has been also shown to be associated with higher number of lifetime episodes more depressive episodes shorter time to relapse and having a lot of subsyndromal and the syndromal episodes earlier age of onset rapid cycling and so on and when we look at the impact of metabolic factors on course and outcome of bipolar disorder it has been said that metabolic syndrome is associated with worse global functioning poor treatment response chronic course of illness and increased risk of rapid cycling and in terms of implications of physical comorbidities we need to understand that various psychotropics have differential effect on various uh, metabolic parameters especially when you look at the antipsychotic clozapine is known to be uh, having higher risk of increasing weight along with olanzapine and but if you look at overall olanzapine is associated with worse metabolic profile except for the blood glucose which is more reported with clozapine so we we need to keep these facts in mind when you're thinking about selecting the various antipsychotics and the other factors in terms of physical comorbidity that needs to be taken into account is the weight gain again a lot of antidepressant we need to recognize understand that are, can also lead to weight gain especially the some drugs like amitriptyline and mirtazapine and when you're trying to choose antidepressant and antipsychotics among the elderly you need to again keep in mind the risk of sedation weight gain and eps because they, these factors may lead to falls and can lead to a lot of complications and uh, the other factor which comes into mind is the young females is the risk of hyperprolactinemia and which again you need to understand the respiridone amisulpride these are associated with more risk of hyperprolactinemia the other factor which is again important in elderly is the risk of falls uh, which is again related to osteopenia and lot of antidepressant and uh, mood stabilizers are known to cause a bone demineralization so when you're thinking about using these drugs on long run we, you you need to keep that in mind that what could be the implications of these drugs in the long run for your patients in terms of uh, choosing the drugs again when we look at various mood stabilizer as valproate carbamazepine oxcarbazepine we need to understand uh, in patient with substance use maybe valproate and carbamazepine are better topiramate can also be considered but in patient with personality disorder there is some evidence to suggest of, for valproate and for migraine again if you look at that all this drugs may be very useful but topiramate if you look at overall is useful for diabetic uh, neuropathy migraine obesity eating disorders substance use so uh, this is a drug uh, again often not too commonly used by the psychiatrist but this is something which we need to keep in mind that it has a good profile which may be useful in patient of bipolar disorder especially when you want to combine two mood stabilizers so what we need to look at besides this course is the understanding the treatment history of the patient because that will again guide you how to choose the medications so we we need to again understand that whatever the medications are being given understanding the course as i have highlighted the predominant polarity and uh, the uh, the mdi pattern dmi pattern seasonality rcd all these can help you in understanding whatever the medication which patient is actually getting is it appropriate for the patient or not and whether the medication which the patient is getting is uh, the serum levels are they adequate or not and we also need to have a clear understanding about the duration of an adequate trial and have understanding about what is a breakthrough episode because sometimes people don't consider these clearly and keep on increasing the medication or keep on changing the medication so we, we need to keep that in mind and the other issue is many patients in our uh, indian setting are poorly adherent to the medication and they discontinue medication that leads to recurrence and relapse we need to keep that in mind when you're considering the recurrence and relapse especially the depressive one uh, when in, in patients who are already an antidepressant they may be actually having antidepressant discontinuation syndrome where there is a depressive relapse so that fact again needs to be taken into account because that can help you because we think that uh, a patient may be actually having antidepressant discontinuation syndrome time and again and we are thinking that these are depressive relapse and actually we keep on either increasing the dose of antidepressant or don't stop the antidepressant and actually uh, risk the patient for a many relapse in future so the ne next point to understand is that what are the features or what are the issues which are there in the due course of the life when patient is actually on better symptom control is that what are the level of residual symptoms between the episodes uh, how do we define switch and i have discussed about the side effects uh, what needs to be considered and 
uh, understanding of a treatment resistant bipolar disorder is again very important. So how do we define treatment resistant bipolar disorder? We all understand treatment resistant schizophrenia more commonly, treatment resistant depression, but definition of treatment resistant bipolar is something many of us are not very familiar. And again, we need to understand that here, the definition is again as understood from the perspective of when you're trying to define bipolar from a acute episode perspective or from a maintenance phase perspective. So in the acute phase, if the person has not resp responded to the two standard medication in the specified period of as uh, six weeks of mania, that is the three, two, three weeks trials, then you consider that it is treatment resistant bipolar mania. And in terms of the maintenance phase, again, if the, during the six months or the three cycle length, if the patient is not uh, his cycling is not stopping, you will consider that the patient is having treatment resistant bipolar. But there are also other definitions, like uh, some people say that failure of multiple trials of combination or the patient fails to respond to non-standard treatment, something like antidepressant. The uh, other definitions which are considered to be clinically, uh, that how do you define clinically unsatisfactory response? So if, if there is a failure to two anti two trials, or if the patient is experiencing breakthrough, then you consider this patient as a treatment resistant bipolar. Why it is important to recognize treatment bipolar uh, treatment resistant bipolar disorder, but because in the acute phase, then the treatment should be consideration of clozapine or, or, or and ECD. And for similarly for maintenance phase, either you can consider clozapine or use of maintenance ECD. This is something we again clozapine, use of clozapine in patient of bipolar disorder is uh, not very common what we normally we see. That is something which we need to understand that if you recognize treatment resistant bipolar disorder and institute close up in, uh, in a due, in, at a proper time, you can actually reduce the number of episodes in the lifetime. Although now there's some evidence to people are talking about novel agents like eripiprazole, bupropion, all these to be used in patient with treatment resistant bipolar disorder uh, before uh, in terms of when you're trying to manage something like bipolar depression. And if if you look at uh, the so-called uh, the BD, I, I, the ISBD task force report on the course and outcome, they again try to define in terms of what are the different definitions of uh, switch, relapse, and recurrence. Again, this is something if you if we understand, we will be able to be very clear when to say it is switch and when you say it is uh, relapse and recurrence. So if you are using antidepressant in a patient and if a patient develops a new episode within eight weeks of starting of antidepressant, it is it should be considered more of a switch than actually a new episode. But if it occurs after eight weeks, you, you can clearly say that it is possibly a part and partial of the bipolar disorder. This is something again, because we are so scared of switch that we don't use it or we don't consider the issue of switch and we keep on using antidepressants. So, so just there's, there's need to be aware of this fact and recovery is understood as when patient is asymptomatic for about eight weeks from both the kind of episodes that will be considered patient having, having a recovery. Because this is again important when you're trying to define RCAD, because RCAD, we are very common, uh, comfortable in defining when patient is having uh, more than four episodes of opposite polarity. That is too depressive, too manic. We are, it's easy to define that after mania, patient is going to depression, from depression to mania, mania to depression. But a patient can have one polarity uh, in one single year, four episodes. So that is where if there is a gap of two months, then you need to consider RCAD there. That, that, that's the importance of understanding these definitions. Then understanding the importance of looking at the total duration of illness is something, again, we just talked about total duration of illness. There, it is important to take into account the time spent in episode, total inter-episodic period between the two episodes that can help you in deciding about whether what kind of medication or for how long you're going to consider pharmacoprophylaxis. And there's another concept of effective morbidity, which takes into account the number of episodes, the duration of episodes, and the severity of episodes. This is an alternative to the predominant polarity because this can give you much better idea because if the patient is spending more time in depressive episodes and has more number of depressive episodes and they are more severe, that will actually strengthen your case that you need to target more of a depressive polarity in your patient. That's how it, it if you combine these two concepts, it can help you in understanding what medication you want to prefer. Then other aspect which can help you help us in determining the use of uh, medication in terms of pharmacoprophylaxis that how patient has done 
when there is on treatment and off treatment. This is something which again needs to be taken into account randomly. All patients of bipolar should not be put on pharmacoprophylaxis, although uh, guidelines will keep on saying you use uh, pharmacoprophylaxis after X number of episodes. But if you're taking a history, patient had one episode 20 years back and now having to a second episode, would you prefer to use pharmacoprophylaxis or not is something which we need to consider practically and which is in the favor of patient because if you're using drugs in an elderly patient one episode 20 years back and now and you are exposing him to metabolic risk how justified you are you need to keep that in mind then then is the issue of the anti inter episodic period there basically we focus on the residual symptoms and that there it becomes again important to distinguish between the residual symptoms and the side effects and also understanding the impact of euthymia and treatment on the comorbidities that will give, give you an idea that how the comorbidities, if you are using drugs which are actually worsening the comorbidities, you need to think how you balance between the comorbidity and the euthymia and also focus on functionality, disability and the cognitive functions because many psychotropics can also again lead to euthymia but may not lead to restoration of functionality and can lead to cognitive impairment. So that's something which we need to keep in mind when we are balancing the selection of drugs. Social factors should not be ignored. We all know that uh, that social rhythm therapy is something which has been talked about in management of bipolar disorders. And that is where we need to understand the importance of the social factors in course of bipolar disorders. So if a patient with bipolar disorders often experience a lot of stigma. They have a lot of frequent life events in their lifetime. And as the course progresses, their social support depletes. It leads to a lot of family impairment, marital problems, and a lot of expressed emotions. So we, we, we need to keep these factors also into my account while choosing pharmacotherapy. Because if you don't address the social factors, again, these factors can destabilize the bipolar disorder. In terms of the social factors, we, we, we need to look take a so-called longitudinal life course approach. You need, need to look at childhood abuse in, in, in terms of any kind of abuse because childhood sexual abuse and uh, or any kind of abuse is associated with a bad kind of a bipolar disorders and occurrence of frequent life events can again worsen the course of bipolar disorders and uh, as these poor social support, uh, family impairment and express emotions, all these factors can destabilize the course. And if you don't address this along with your pharmacotherapy, just doing pharmacotherapy doesn't will not lead uh, give you that kind of a joy that you the patient will be able to achieve you thank you. Family history and its impact again has been evaluated and here we, we need to understand when we talk about family history again is the childhood family history where how the child has been grown up because it is now understood that it's not the, the adverse childhood adversities not only associated with mental disorders but also with the chronic medical illnesses and this basically the uh, health behaviors are the common pathways for both both kind of disorders. So, so uh, looking at this if you have a, that kind of an understanding that these are the factors this, which are there in this patient, which can actually worsen the longitudinal course in the future, need, need to start addressing these issues which may require psychological interventions. And childhood sexual abuse, again, I, I do not like to repeat that it's associated with poor outcome. And in terms of family history, we need to talk, take into account the treatment response. If there's a history of good response to lithium in the family, and their course, you can, you can think about what kind of drugs and whether you need to use pharmacoprophylaxis or not, and how the caregivers are coping with the illness, how much the caregiver burden, and what is the stigma and other things the caregivers are experiencing, because a caregiver also plays an important role in the total outcome of bipolar disorder. So what we need to do, why we need to do, and how we need to do is something which we need to keep in mind. So how we need to go about we need to understand that we need to always take a life chart of the patient, look at their temperament, look at the kind of mixed features, whether these are present during the episodes or not. We need to look at this and take into consideration before choosing any medication. So uh, the National Institute of Mental Health retrospective life chart has been recommended, which can be either drawn by the clinicians or the self-rated. In our Bitcoin study, which was done in India, which we uh, did, uh, sometime back and the second uh, part of the study is already on. So if you look at that, we just made this kind of a performa which can help uh, the clinicians in determining the course of bipolar disorders. So once you have done this kind of course determination for your patient, it will give you a clear understanding 
what you want to do for your patient and what are the factors you want to address. So a live chart can be filled up in terms of what are the preceding factors for each episode, what are the type of episodes, severity, duration, whether patient had suicidal behavior, what kind of treatment patient has received, hospitalization and other things. So this can give you a clear understanding if this is being completed by a resident kind of a person, it will give you understanding what medication you want to choose. And the severity and other things can also be drawn using this chart. And in this Bitcoin 2, now we have again updated this substance use and physical and psychiatric comorbidity, how they are, they are affecting bipolar disorder. So this is what we are trying to evaluate in the second part of the study. So that's where we need to understand how the substance use is related to the onset of illness. How does it influence the next episodes or whether it increases during the episodes or not something which we need to take into consideration. We have different instruments for assessment of temperament. Again, the temps uh, for the adults and also the for adolescent have been uh, devised by the Ekiskal group. So these, these instruments can be used to understand the different temperaments. And this uh, the, the, this is different from what we try to understand the childhood temperament because this, this is this temperament assessment is more commonly uh, is actually related to the bipolar disorders and different uh, structure have been reported for different structural domains have been reported for this temperament which we need to understand. So coming to the recommendation from different guidelines, if you look at that, uh, they, they will say that use lithium for acute mania, maintenance, prevention and so on and they, they give different kind of evidence for different episodes. But if, if you try to understand the course and outcome, these simple recommendations do not make much of sense when you are thinking about choosing drugs because these recommendations only take into account the current symptoms or just in general what to use in maintenance. But if, if you understand the course and outcome, it will help you better to understand the course choosing the drugs. So what we need to understand that Management of bipolar disorder actually in, in a routine clinical practice is an uh, art which is should be based on science and we, we need to learn to balance both depressive and manic phase and we will need to get the patients in a place where he's euthymic and we can maintain the euthymia as long as possible. So to conclude, the management of bipolar disorder should not focus on the current episode only. We need to take into account the longitudinal course of the disorders. We need to understand the factors which influence the longitudinal course of the disorder and management should focus on holistic care by addressing all the factors that influence the treatment outcome and psychosocial interventions are an important uh, support to the pharmacotherapy in improving the overall course and outcome of bipolar disorder. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for a wonderful enlightening talk. Really refreshing, <laughs> better Thank topic, you. and you have made it interesting once again. Yeah. So over to chairpersons for their opening remarks. Then we can go to question answers. Excellent session, sir, as usual, and it is learning curve for all of us because, and the more is to add because the last Bitcoin one and now ongoing Bitcoin two has given more insight about the Indian patient and multicentric about more hundred, more than seven hundred patients. So in that way, we all will be happy to hear from you in the Q&A section about that, sir, about the insights of Indian evidence. Thank you. I agree with Narish that uh, it had been a beautiful session, a lot of enlightenment and a lot of complexities which were delivered very crisply for us as take home. And uh, this would definitely uh, give us a lot of insight into uh, managing the things. And if there are any questions, I will ask the moderator to take over for the questions. Yeah, many questions in chat box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. many questions. Amrit. Yeah. So, boss, thank you so much. Fine. Fine. You know, it was, it was wonderful. You covered every question that could have come. So, even though the topic is great, yeah. There's so many facets to it, but you managed to, you know, cover up most of the facets. Um, there are certain questions, and it was really good. It's it's really even though we have our own algorithms, but the way you we go about it is sometimes we also don't know why we are giving a certain drug in a certain condition. We 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 might be having the art, but the science sometimes we like the science behind the art. So thank you for you know making it so good, so easy for us. 
Now, there are certain things, I, I think most of the questions are very, very, uh, you know, there are very few questions, but one question that comes up and, you know, is about endoxifen, sir. So, yeah. in, in your algorithm, you know, there's a lot of marketing push for endoxifen. And uh, uh, I've been a little skeptical of endoxifen, even though I am doing a study on endoxifen. So, you know, the, 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 the drug, how, how, how comfortable are you with endoxifen and where will you put it in your algorithm? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your question. And because we are out of the NNC guideline, I can speak about endoxifen now. <laughs> okay. So what we need to understand that endoxifen has been only evaluated in patients of bipolar mania and those with mixed episodes. That basically means mania with mixed features. So we have evidence for that. And again, there are only one study from India. And uh, this second paper has recently been again published. So uh, there's some evidence, but again, these studies have, uh, the endoxifen has not taken, uh, the studies which have evaluated endoxifen has not taken this whole concept of the longitudinal course. So till we don't have more data and we don't have pooling of the data to understand how the course factors are taken into account in uh, uh, using endoxifen, or I can only say that it is effective in management of acute phase of bipolar mania or mixed ep episodes, but further evidence is still to emerge at least in the published literature. Can I ask yeah. another question? Sure. Sure, sure. Pregnancy, bipolar depression, what will you choose, sir? Yeah, uh, pregnancy and bipolar disorders. So what we need to understand in first trimester, preferably avoid all kind of mood stabilizers if possible and uh, use, if required, use antipsychotics especially first generation antipsychotics. Again, it will depend on what kind of uh, episode the patient is into. But from the second trimester and the third trimester, lithium is safer. When it comes to postpartum again, the game changes. Valproate and uh, carmazepine are uh, considered to be better than lithium when it comes to postpartum management. So the, the, these are the different factors which we need to understand. So you're talking about lithium. Can we convince our patients about lithium? Because the moment they get out of the clinic, see, you know, they just click on the Google and, you know, lithium is, is more terrible than a nuclear bomb, sir. If you look uh, at... uh, sir, it is not in my experience. At sir, least sir, sir, Andres, Andres, not sir, please. Yeah. Uh, in, in my experience, my patients are more comfortable in taking lithium because it's no, uh, you need to understand when you're presenting lithium to the patient, always try to compare what are the other options and what are their demerits. If you are able to present that form of a kind of a comparative analysis for your patient, they prefer to choose lithium. So the, we need to keep that in mind. Oxcarbazepine? Oxcarbazepine, again, evidence is not much. People are using it in published literature. Again, evidence is not much. Evidence for oxcarbazepine? First amazing chal raha hai. karta hu, call back. Sir, we use a lot of oxcarbazepine for bipolar and we get very good results. Yes, it is a, it's a congener of carmazepine. So definitely carmazepine has been shown to be effective. There is no doubt about it. But again, in terms of using it in pregnancy, it is a no-no drug. We, we need to understand that. Uh, in, so, epilepsy, so, in epilepsy, sir, it is recommended. If you, if you look at mood stabilizers, oxcarbazepine is recommended in epilepsy in pregnant females. So... Why can't we think among, of among, among the various various anti-epileptics again more evidence or more safer efficacy is talked about lamotrigine. So not that for oscarmazepine also. Oscarmazepine literature is not that big as lamotrigine. There may be some data, but for carmazepine, definitely I'm talking about carmazepine, it is total no-no. Yes. So yeah. lamotrigine versus oxcarbazepine, which will you prefer in bipolar sir? Again, I said, if I look at my course of the illness, it is more of depressive polarity. My choice is very clear. I'll go for Lamotrigine. Are you convinced about it or you are only convinced about the literature, sir? No, I'm convinced about Lamotrigine. I, I will add, uh, Amrit, Amrit, I agree with you. Uh, how is how potent is Lamotrigine as a mood stabilizer? How effective it is actually? Sir, that is what I'm saying. If a patient has predominant bipolar depressive polarity, more number of depressive episodes in the lifetime. Uh, that is where the lamotrigine is going to work. And that is where the valproate is actually not going to work. So if you are not able to use lithium, lamotrigine is a second choice. If you are able to use uh, uh, lithium, then 
nothing like that okay so boss uh, in, in, sir, in bipolar uh, bipolar depression hmm. yeah how often uh, do we actually use uh, antidepressants because more often than not uh, only uh, uh, mood stabilizers may not work so so your experience versus the literature what, what does it say indian Sir, experience uh, the, the my own experience and what i see in day to day clinical practice and majority of the patients clinicians tend to use antidepressant under the cover of a mood stabilizer so that's a routine clinical practice which most of us end up doing it especially in patients who have moderate to severe depression uh, and I prefer to use it again if patient has predominantly depressive polarity and I, I don't have a history of switch and I'm using in combination with lithium, I tend to use antidepressant. I will not shy away from accepting that. I uh, uh, Literature says don't use antidepressant, but that's not reality. We all end up using antidepressant. Sir, okay. And, and so what I is the right time to stop antidepressant then? Okay. What is the right course? Yeah. So the uh, in terms of uh, the stopping the antidepressant again, in fact, you'll be happy to know the, the most recent study which has come on this account is from India. The maximum data that for that is from the NIMAN. And what does that suggest that there is no major difference if you stop antidepressant after uh, two months or you, you continue it for about one year. So no major difference in terms of number of relapses, but the sample size for that study is smaller. Although stopping early is associated with less risk of manic switch. That's there. But otherwise, no major difference has come up. So what is the risk of uh, again going into depression? I stop antidepressant and patient again goes into D. The, the, again, the risk of depression going into depression is higher when if you stop antidepressant after a, a two months. Okay, Amrit. Mania. Sir, yeah. khara so at a treatment, patient is dysphoric. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what all you can do? Either you can reduce the mood stabilizer, patient might switch. Yes. Or two, you can add a antidepressant. Or you can add a stimulant. Or you can add a thought process. Mein so Nein, we, we are, just, just, just a minute. We are talking about dysphoric mania. We are talking about dysphoric depression. So let's. We are, let's... About, we are talking about mania on treatment, dysphoria. Agya, which it. is the thing which we see. That is why many people don't generally take the medications. That's that's one of the causes of non compliance or non adherence. Now, what yeah. do we do? What do we do? That's where we need to understand that whenever a patient is coming out of mania, uh, the important issue there is talking about this, taking care of the psychosocial issues there and his personal issues. Because many times the patient who come out of mania, especially those who are coming out of hypomania, they don't like losing their powers and energy. So that is where you need to make them understand that what they were going through was abnormal. And that is where the whole psychosocial issue and the uh, psychosocial intervention and psychoeducation comes into picture. That, that That is something which is often neglected in the clinical care. Let me, let me be very honest about that. Uh, in terms of dysphoric mania, to start with, if there is a dysphoric mania, I would prefer to start with Valproid. No, 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 sir. You don't understand my question. Haan, I have taken care of my patient. I have not neglected my patient. I have yes. talked to my patient and is telling, I want, I am not feeling good. Yeah. So Which that is... is yeah. Yeah. Sir. Now, what do we do? It is not about me. It is not about you. If you have a team, it is good. Some, many of 90%, 99% of don't have, don't have a team. They need to give a solution. So what will you do when you have a case like this? See, what, would you, what would be your suggestion? My, my suggestion would be monitoring the patient first that when he's coming out of mania, whether he's actually going into depression or he is not liking that, that he's losing what he had during the manic phase. That is where the whole psychosocial inter assessment and intervention will come in. Medications are something which you need to understand if you're using something like antipsychotics like respiridone that may be contributing to more of emergence of depressive symptoms so that may be something which you may have to consider of reducing the dose of respiridone so the, the, it totally will have to be individualized as per the patient there is no one to one answer to that but these are three factors which you need to take into account okay uh well, dr devendra basera wants to ask Sure. Uh, about this uh, inter-episodic period, suppose 
the episode is over but lot of difficulties usually subclinical mild intensity inter episodic uh, issues are there so what are those issues and what is their management commonly found see again we we need to evaluate whether these are side effects or these are residual symptoms residual depressive symptoms or residual manic symptoms or these are whatever we are considering as interepisodic symptoms are they part of some kind of comorbidity so so we we need to understand these uh, issues step by step that are these residual symptoms are these side effects or are are these comorbid issues or are there any psychosocial issues which are coming into picture which are causing the problem because as the patient improves from the depression and mania a lot of express emotion may come in if there there is sexual sexual dysfunction coming in or the work related stress coming in so that lot of factors will come into picture so you you need to do an individualized assessment to understand what are the factors which are contributing to destabilization of the interepisodic period sometimes again as the patient stabilizes we forget about these issues which will come in so that's what i just want to highlight that we need to look into these factors and consider management it's maximum people talk about the residual symptoms when you're talking about residual symptoms you need to keep in mind that residual symptoms in patient with bipolar uh, what is seen more commonly are residual depressive symptoms but often when we talk about depressive symptoms if you look at the literature these are more of anxiety symptoms and if properly diagnosed they are, these are comorbid anxiety disorders and there you can always use antidepressant under the cover of mood stabilizer if you require that so so individualization of management personalized care is something which we need to keep in mind when you're looking at the interepisodic period Okay. Thank you, sir. Sir, recurrent depression. When do you think that we should give a mood stabilizer? Okay. Uh, recurrent depression. Again, the indication for mood stabilizer is when patient has treatment resistant depression, mm -hmm. and when you you think that you have already tried tried two or three anti uh, depressant trials, you have done adequate trials, and the patient is not responding, and there is you you want to combine antidepressant with something else, so. There, there, there is a choice between choosing a second antidepressant, using lithium, or going for ECT. But where, what we need, I just want to emphasize here that the evidence for lithium, you need to understand that the whole evidence of use of lithium in bi, uh, unipolar depression is when it is used in combination with TCS, not with SSRIs. For with SSRIs, we do not have actual evidence. Evidence is only for combining TCS and lithium. So that that fact needs to be kept in mind. Sure. Okay. But suppose there is uh, rapid cycling and we yeah. cannot give valprate because of certain reasons. So what are the yeah. options? Yeah. Again, rapid cycling, again, I said, where is the predominant polarity? Is it depressive, manic, or is it equal? So that is where the second option will come in is combining two mood stabilizers. So you can combine lithium with maybe carmazepine, oxcarmazepine, or an antipsychotic. Or if it's a predominant depressive polarity, you can think of combining lithium and lamotrigine. So, so again, we, we need to keep these combinations in mind. That is where I just, again, I'm focusing. Don't look at just one picture. Look at the longitudinal picture and then take a decision. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So there is a question on role of ketamine in bipolar depression. Yeah. Yeah. There is evidence for that. It is emerging that ketamine can be used for management of uh, acute bipolar depression. But again, uh, if you have to use other effective measures to manage uh, depression because as soon as you stop ketamine, there is high risk of relapse. So it, it that's why ketamine is usually reserved for patients who do not have psychotic symptoms during the episodes and patients are suicidal. Otherwise, once you stop ketamine, there is again chance of relapsing. Okay. Uh, there is a question on Lurosidone. So, how well tolerated it is and how effective it is? I, I, as I said, that as per the literature suggests, Lurosidone is more effective in, towards managing bipolar depressive phase. Uh, in terms of tolerability, my experience uh, is not very good. It, it, it leads to extrapyramidal kind of side effects, and that's why I don't prefer to use it too much. So, I've, I've not used that molecule too much. And the, in terms of tolerability, my experience is not very good with the molecule. Sir, yeah. So, two more mood yes. stabilizers. Which one will you use, sir? Which combinations yeah. you best? 
if you have to use two moodster blazers uh again uh, my my experience again is lithium plus lamotrigine or lithium plus valproate these are the two preferred combinations which i prefer to use again depending on the course and other features into account naresh sir naresh sir ek minute aapka kya hoga preference I'll go with this because most of the time, most of clinician lithium is well prepared. But the second part of the answer, if the predominant polarity is depressive, then lamotrigine is going to help. And I had good experience with lamotrigine, but in depressive. Sir, some clinicians have, uh, I have heard saying that patient को थोड़ा सा hypomania में रहने दो. So is it possible कि उसको हम hypomania में रहने दे सकते हैं without any adverse uh, risks? uh again uh, i don't prefer to do that because a patient remaining in hypomania leads to a lot of caregiver issues and then the patient loses the, their caregiver because then they they don't trust you as a clinician because the, their issues are not being taken care of we, what we need to understand that many times the patient of bipolar are brought to you by the caregivers and if you don't take their issues into account and just want to keep the your patient in hypomania it's it's that although you you think that your patient is happy but the caregiver is definitely going to think about choosing uh, switching the clinician so basically then we are not properly treating the patient we are yeah. half heartedly treating yeah. yeah another part it may go to mania then it will be difficult to handle after yeah. hypomania yeah yes yes uh, dr bhavani wants to ask bipolar with uh, ocd with history of switch on ssri then how to manage again whether the switch was under the cover of a mood stabilizer or not if uh, it it was under the cover of a mood stabilizer the again need to check what was the dose of uh, lithium for example you were using what were the serum levels is there a possibility of optimizing the dose of lithium further so if you have that option of optimizing the dose of lithium further consider that before adding another mood stabilizer to you cover for uh, antidepressant induced switch and again i have said antidepressant induced switch please remember how you are defining if it is occurring only after 8 weeks then consider that this as switch if it is occurring before uh, sorry occurring before 8 weeks then only consider this as switch if it is occurring after 8 weeks consider this as independent episode please so that is where we, we need to keep that fact it also into mind Amrit, Amrit, you are muted. Yeah. Renal impairment, hepatic impairment. What would be your most stabilizer of choice? Okay, a, a, a renal impairment, predominant depressive, lamotrigine. Okay, uh, hepatic impairment, no for valproate. So, so again, it will depend on what you are dealing with. But often, I tend to end up using only antipsychotic in those patients. So, so if if it is an elderly patient. having renal or hepatic impairment i will just try to manage the patient only with antipsychotics if, but if still destabilizes then i will think about adding a mood stabilizer otherwise i prefer to use only antipsychotic in such a situation uh, sir what about lithium in uh, hepatic cases uh, uh, patients with uh, uh, it is not metabolized it is said ki yes hepatic. you can use that's what i said you can use lithium but depending again i am saying that what is the level of impairment what you are dealing with Uh, uh in hepatic impairment or uh, renal impairment if i don't want to risk i just start with one medication that would be an antipsychotic and just see how patient tolerates and if he is having relapses or not and then in the next episode i'll think about what i want to go further so there because, are two questions because when we see a patient in the walk in it's not always that we start with a mood stabilizer at the first visit so you can but we tend to start with an antipsychotic especially when you're dealing with a manic episode so or if you are dealing with a depressive episode you will use a combination of antidepressant and maybe an antipsychotic so two questions on cariprazine bolo uh, cariprazine can it cause switch and how 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 to use it properly ah uh, sir uh, sorry i i do not have much experience of using cariprazine but there are certain reports about switch with cariprazine but again we, we need to understand that uh these all factors are in the form of only case report and we do not have a solid evidence for that so so i will not try to run down any molecule i will just leave it at that i do not have personal have personal experience of using that too much I, 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 can i can i add 
I have used little caribrazin in a lot of bipolar depression patients, negative schizophrenia, but I've never got a switch. There, are, there might be a little elevation of mood, but never the polarity has changed. And I am used it in a lot of big number of patients. So I think it's not that unsafe. You know, case reports will be there with every molecule. You know? Yeah, so, that's what I'm saying. But I had, I had, I had a good experience with that. Uh, sir, Ali, of course. ियंस are very severe bipolar so do you share this experience because the guidelines pe jo dikhta hai lagta hai ki wo jin patients ke bare mein bataya hai i do not see such patient i see very uh, severe sort of patient and whenever i talk to people they also so so your comments on this yeah are the guidelines okay. uh, actually targeting the right persons uh, see the problem is that in our setting i can look at your question from two perspective in our setting many patient with bipolar 2 actually don't come to for treatment they are happy with cycling so that's why we are seeing only the severe end of people and those who have bipolar 2 families also okay with small high and low and they don't it doesn't matter to them until as the depressive phase last longer or the hypomanic phase last longer uh, when it comes that's where you possibly don't tend to see those kind of patients and that's why we we do say that what we are seeing is not as per the guideline and the other factor which i have said that in indian setting uh, the recurrent mania has been reported much more commonly than what we talk about uh, a combination of depressive and manic episodes so that's where recurrent mania episodes I mean that is again a very severe end of an illness which we are seeing in terms of bipolar depression again what western guidelines talk about uh, by bipolar depression again i will say here that we are not seeing that kind of a bipolar depression or maybe we tend to use antidepressant much earlier that's why we don't face too much of problem in managing bipolar disorder amrit manmeet has a question rapid yeah. cycling patients valproate and lithium is a good option your comment sir no can you just repeat the question yeah uh, question seems to be in rapid cyclers valproate and lithium uh, are good options So yes, your on this. Uh, the RCAD. The data suggests that the, the, there is not much to choose between uh, uh, lithium and valproate. But if the patient is not stabilizing on one mood stabilizer, you should use a combination of two. So, so uh, there is no evidence to suggest either of them. But the other way to answer it is that if RCAD also the patient is experiencing and the, it is more of only hypomanic episode and the depressive episodes are longer, more severe. you will target dep depression so you'd use lithium but if your hypomanic episodes are in fact these are manic episodes you will tend to use more of valproate amrit here through so so inviting care persons for their experience on this topic their comments on the program and whatever take home points you want to tell us the chair persons please manasu sir You are muted, sir. Please mute me. Oh, घर में नहीं हो. Hold on. Well, uh, so it's a lot of thing today. The only thing is that we have to just ensure that always made program for every patient with the kind of bipolarity the person is going through the inter episodic interval variation which people have. Kind of stages people have some people having the rapid cycling and others do not having it. So all those conditions and the comorbidities attached, medical comorbidities are there. But which they are people having dual diagnosis, medical things. All in all, make it very challenging. And we see that all these guys which we have gone through today are going to help us a lot. Well, selecting proper medication. For the patient, for the proper duration, so that not to have recurrences, and that needs to be helpful. And I thank uh, both Alim and uh, Amrit for giving me this opportunity for a part of this program learning. Thank you very much, and to to Fan Pati sir as well. Thank you.
would wish. Uh, I would uh, reverse the sequence. So thanks to organizers, to Fan Pati sir, uh, Dr. Amrit, Dr. Alim for for this wonderful topic and uh, great speaker to deliver on this. So my questions, uh, Sandeep sir, one is, uh, do you also see that lithium is relatively underutilized because seeing the papers, seeing the audits, more is the well-prayed, the choice of people without even knowing the course. Two is again the experience of psychotherapeutic uh, uh, approaches in this bipolar because somewhere it is talked much less compared to depression. And the third, which I said earlier, your mm -hmm. insight about Bitcoin one for, for the people because many audience are here. Okay. Uh, so coming to your first question, what we need to understand that underutilization of lithium, what we need to understand because I have led both the studies. If I look at the prescription study, which talked about prescription of psychotropics in the walk-in clinics, yes. in the different centers, Valproate is the predominant drug which is started for new patients. But when we studies have been done who are patient on long-term management, most of the data suggest that lithium is the preferred drug. What does that mean? That somewhere during the course, the lithium, the Valproate is switched to lithium. So that's one thing which we need to keep in mind. Uh, the In terms of Valproate, we need to keep this in mind that Valproate is not a preferred drug in reproductive age group among females. In fact, it is contraindicated. So please be very clear to avoid Valproate in females in the reproductive age group. So the, if you keep in that, and what we are seeing, newer generation is not using lithium. So I'll recommend all my newer generation friends to trust lithium, use it more and more. It's a very good molecule. Side effects, you see, they are seen in long run. but if you think that somebody is going to develop renal impairment after 20 years, but you have given him a good quality of life of 20 years, that fact needs to be kept in mind rather than giving a poor quality of life for 20 years without using lithium. So please keep that in mind. Don't just jump into conclusion about the side effects and just, just make a decision. Uh, regarding the psychotherapeutic intervention, again, very important in terms of management of bipolar disorder, proper psychoeducation education, family intervention, interpersonal psychotherapy, cognitive behavior therapy, IPSRT, all these have very good level of evidence and wherever it is required, please combine it with pharmacotherapy. Otherwise, you are not managing patients of bipolar disorder properly. Uh, coming to the issues about the Bitcoin study. So what we did was we had a study, we did a study across 15 centers. Uh, we had 778 patients in that study. And what we saw there was that in our setup, bipolar 2 is not that common. Patients uh, have significant impairment in their quality of life. Uh, so they, they, are, they have significant disability, have significant cognitive impairment during the interepisodic period. And a reasonable number of patients run a recurrent mania course. Uh, in terms of use of medication, again, Lithium is a preferred mood stabilizer there. So that is where I just want everybody to again understand lithium is a preferred drug, not Valproate. When we look at the people with bipolar disorder, especially those who have a duration of illness of more than 10 years. So that's that was a more of a descriptive study. That's where I will keep the, my uh, discussion on that. The bit two, Bitcoin 2, which is now going on there, we are not just limiting to patients who are only in euthymia. We are taking both patients in ep episode and who are in euthymia, so we'll come out with their findings maybe in a year's time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank Over to moderators you. and to Fanpati, sir. And it was really an academic piece for all of us. Thank you. Tufan, sir, over to you. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. I was all through this meeting, but for some time, I had a weak connection. I was only listening to over the, the connection. And thank you, Dr. Sandeep, for a very nice, elaborate, lucid presentation of this often repeated but quite relevant issue. And everyone has got its own biases. But I find every psychiatrist develops a mental construct over his experience in which he approaches with this case. As Sandeep, Dr. Gohuru has telling, guidelines apart that takes the prevalence. And there is the art comes. And the population which we deal with, that is also important. At times in remote places you have to see. But what I have found, 
in prescriptions that come to me. So, Valproate is the most common medicine that has been prescribed. That I subscribe to her Sandeep Rastrup. Lithium is a very good malik. It can be tried. It can be tried. It should not be just dumped in the... Because every, every molecule has a side effect which does not have. It is important for the particular patient which is improved. Beneficial. And thanks again for all your you know, deliberation. It is a nice topic. And over Thank to... You, and I also compliment the chairpersons, Manasi, whom I have seen since he was a very, very small kid. And that Nivinani. Amrit, over to you to conclude. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So, first of all, today was a little difficult day and a very good day also because we were most of us were supposed to be on transit in Srinagar, out of Manasvi, sitting in Srinagar from his hotel room. <laughs> Bro, sir, you are, where are you? You are in Srinagar or you are in Chandigarh? Sir, in my office. Office. So, so it was a tough day. Ali was telling, should we postpone it? I don't know. Let us continue it. And then the whole, you know, the NMC thing came. The people told, why to rent name it there? So those who there. don't know, me, me and Alim are in meetings for last four days only. We just meet, meetings and meetings from morning to evening. Doing only meetings. <laughs> so keep kissing and kissing. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> It's tough to be in the position you are and we are trying to be in that position. That is the most tougher, tougher part of it. So anyway, it was very, very comprehensive. It is one of the most comprehensive things. You know, in one hour, you cannot ask for more. I'm, I'm guaranteeing people here, in one hour, you can't ask for more. Every angle, every bit was covered. It was, it was truly wonderful. Some of the things in special population, they covered it in the question answer session. And we asked a lot of questions actually. And, so, thank you so much. It was really comprehensive and we appreciate all my the pleasure. effort. Thank you. And we have two great chairpersons. My dear friend Manasvi was telling, I might not be able to log in. I told you, you have to log in. And he was there patiently listening, taking up questions and guiding us also. Thank you, Manasvi. Naresh Bhai, thank you again. You've always thank been you, brilliant. We love the way you carry on your academics with a smile, humble and genuine. So thank you for coming again to Musings and making it a better affair. Thank you, Tufan, sir, always giving a different perspective. He is that wise man who, who, who comes last, but his two lines are enough to bowl you over. Thank you, Alim, for allowing me to ask some questions today. You know, you know, bipolar is my favorite topic, so I told him I need to bowl some balls also. So thank you, everybody. We had a good attendance. We were not expecting the 160, you know, peak of 160, and that's that's great. Thank you all again. Thank you, Torrent, again for you know cooperating with us. We don't take any financial grant, but if that's a process that's already 156 episodes long. So discontinuing something is not so easy, you know. So thank you for bearing with us. Thank you, everybody. I hope to see you again next Thursday and another musings. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Dr. Grover, some people are requesting for slides. I know you won't share, but you might. He can Good share the PDF part, I guess. Yeah, PDF. He is on the phone, but I guess PDF can be uploaded. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, yeah. Thank and you. we will upload this session. Uh, Rover, uh, sir, they are requesting your presentation, maybe PDF format. You will get a publication out of it shortly, so don't worry. It is it will be published recently and, and in the next few days. You will get the lecture. Already, somebody told me it has, it has already been published. It has just to, we have to see it. Yeah, it will be published. Don't worry. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night, Good night. Good night everybody. Thank you. Thank you.